Wow, what a wonderful crowd. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the honor of serving as the Jonathan Fanton Director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of uh, Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, I want to welcome you all to Roosevelt House, a home that both Henry Morgenthau and Robert Morgenthau visited often in their day. Um, we are here for a conversation with the author of the acclaimed book. And full disclosure, at the top, I acclaimed it myself in a review <laughs> in the Wall Street Journal, although our guest insists that he did not, does not read reviews. So I could have been more critical if I wanted to, but I wasn't. It's, it's uh, Morgenthau, Power, Privilege, and the Rise of an American Dynasty, a magisterial, multi-generational biography by our guest, Andrew Meyer. Welcome. Thank you. Her. So as I mentioned, and I mentioned at the top of my review as well, um, we had the honor of welcoming the DA here a um, few years ago. He, I think he was already 99 at the time. Just let's look at this and the occasion. The occasion was the naming of the stairway the, the, on, the, on the west side of the building in his honor. And as you see, he was quite frail. And then we handed him the microphone, and he did about 10 minutes of uh, <laughs> reminiscence about cufflinks and the stairway and bounding up the stair with his father. It was just amazing. And here you see him with his successor, Cy Vance, as he was telling this, the story. What's the next slide? Let's have a look. And there's the plaque. When you go upstairs uh, for the reception and uh, the book signing, which I hope you'll all attend, you can have a look at the plaque as well. Before, before we start, um, I want to welcome a few special guests. You probably know that uh, D.A. Morgenthau was famous for mentoring assistant district attorneys, some of whom you may have heard of um, John F. Kennedy Jr., Andrew Cuomo, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, and others. One of those ADAs is here tonight, and she is the New York State Inspector General, Lucy Lang. Lucy, stand up. <laughs> I'm so glad she's here. Uh, she brought her parents, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that her dad is uh, the star of only the um, biggest box office film in history, Avatar, Stephen Lang. <laughs> and particularly special welcome to a guest um, who has been here before. We are so honored to welcome Robert Morgenthau. <laughs> So, Andrew's uh, bio is in your program. I want to really um, let him have most of the time uh, on this program, so I am going to, um, well, first I want to welcome President Rab, who's here. <laughs> you may need a seat, though. Okay. So, um, Let's start with the first generation of Morgenthau's that you talk about, the amazing, uh, mysterious Lazarus Morgenthau. Um, tell us a little bit about him and his emigration to the United States. Thank you, Harold, and thank you all for being here. It's fantastic to see so many faces, uh, even in the three years plus. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great three years plus of this pandemic, uh, and especially uh, to be here with uh, Harold Holzer and to be in this place which lives and breathes with the Morgenthau spirit and the Roosevelt spirit together. Uh, I've been really fortunate to have a number of great talks in and around New York. This is a really special one tonight, so we're gonna have some fun. Um, there are four generations. It's complicated. We'll try to keep it simple. 
Um, and I, uh, we'll start with Lazarus. Um, mentioned a little bit to you that I live in before that I live in Brooklyn, uh, in Cobble Hill, and we were joking about how who had ever heard of Cobble Hill, Brooklyn. Lazarus Morgenthau actually arrived not in Manhattan, but in Brooklyn, in Cobble Hill, in 1866. It was not called that then. Uh, and he and his children and his wife Babette lived for a short time, about three blocks from where we live now. Um, that's not the reason why I started on this <laughs> decade-long uh, journey. Um, but it does speak to the arrival, which the DA, uh, Robert Morgenthau, um, always went back to. And he spoke right here, I don't know if it was on this stage, uh, about immigration. And uh, the story really is uh, a classic American story of immigrants. And it begins in 1866, as I said, with Henry Morgenthau, a 10-year-old boy coming from Bavaria. His father, Lazarus, uh, had an interesting journey before he even reached Brooklyn. He had been born in a large Orthodox Jewish family in Bavaria, what is modern-day modern southern Germany. And he was born something of a gambler, something of an inventor. From an early age, he showed, and I, I knew none of this, of course, when I started out. Um, we'll talk a little bit about my approach to the, the topic and, and uh, beginning the research. But very little of Lazarus's time in Germany was really known. Very little of it is still known, although there are a number of great German historians um, and even archaeologists working on it uh, to restore those early German roots in the, in the early 19th century. Um, he broke free of every possible bound he could, whether it was his faith, orthodoxy, whether it was his large family, whether it was his class, whether it was poverty, and he had an incredible success story to when he becomes a free citizen of Mannheim, meets uh, the Duke, I don't want to give away the whole first part of the book, uh, the Duke of Baden, um, and becomes a cigar baron. His kid brother, Max, had gone ahead of him to San Francisco uh, during the gold rush, and together they had this idea, what about taking cigars hand-rolled in Germany and Bavaria and sent to San Francisco, where coincidentally I'm from. And uh, Morgenthau Brothers was born, and it was an enormously successful um, transatlantic trade, up until a man named Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and the tariffs of the Civil War and the Lincoln tariffs, you can teach me something about, I hope I got it right in the book, um, basically made those, that last shipment when he bet everything a dead loss, as the family, uh, Henry uh, Sr. would later write, the, the, the last shipment from Germany arrived a day late. And so when Lazarus comes with his large family, he already has lost almost everything. He sold, uh, successfully sold that large mansion in Mannheim, so he wasn't penniless. But from then on, although he spent more than 30 years in New York, he never adapted. He never spoke English. He was always an outsider. He tried to reinvent himself again and again and again. He believed in the American idea that uh, we, can, we can find ourselves anew here in New York. New York was absolutely the promised man, the, cap the capital of the new world, their new world, America. But he was always an outsider and struggling. Uh, his long-suffering wife, Babette, 14 children in 23 years. Of course, not all of them survived um, past infancy. Um, one after another, tragedies, some of them quite dramatic. Um, a son who uh, overdosed, and it was on the front page of the New York Times, <laughs> of opioid, I should say. Um, and an abusive husband, Lazarus, who is eccentric, uh, to say the least. And at the end of his life, after scheme after scheme, some of which were quite inventive and ingenious and profitable. Um, his son, Henry, is forced to quit City College um, and goes to Columbia Law School, I think at 17 or 16 even. And in the letters that I was able to find at the Library of Congress, reading between the lines, that inventiveness, he says, Papa, you're bordering on the edge of criminality. <laughs> and not far from where we are tonight, Lazarus dies, I'm being very telegraphic here, um, a very sad and lonely death, essentially as a pauper, uh, having lost everything, um, including 
one of the most fanciful schemes of the late 19th century in New York called the Temple of Humanity, which I won't get into right now. But it's a great story. It's a great story. Um, so Henry Sr. has to intervene in sort of reverse parenting. He, is, he separates his parents, basically, right? And, and has his father committed at least once. So he is taking over the family at a fairly young age in sort of an unnatural but required way. Um, goes to Columbia Law School. I'm just re repeating what I learned from you there. To transition to Henry. So Henry goes, uh, Henry becomes a lawyer, but as you write, um, great detail, great stories about the real estate boom that he handles so brilliantly. He goes into real estate. Tell us what, it, why not, why his law colleagues thought it was not the right thing for him to do, and then how he overcame that. I may, break, I, I may break my rule. I may go back tonight and quietly read the review, actually, because <laughs> someone today just said, uh, someone today just said, who is a blood relative, uh, you know, I'm listening to the book. It's a long book, short chapters, and I'm told, thankfully, that it reads very quickly. Uh, but this relative said, it's great about Lazarus, it's great about the rise of New York, the making of New York, but when you get to the real estate stuff, boy, does it slow down. So you really made my no, night I already don't think here. It, no, I don't and, think it does. And actually, uh, a lot of that um, was... And I'll prompt you for the exciting parts. No, you thank you. Remember them. I, I personally fell in love with that. I probably uh, paid... Uh, I don't know, six or seven years earning the PhDs I never got. One of them was in New York, in New York real estate. Uh, and I did something um, uh, early on, on the history side for the New Deal. You go to see the pros. I went to go see John Morton Blum at Yale, uh, who's taught more senators and more presidents than anyone. He had spent 15 years with the Treasury Secretary, Henry Jr. We're going to get to him in a minute. Um, but I also sought out historians of... Wall Street, historians of New York real estate, they do exist, but they heard, and you'll appreciate this, as many in the audience, when I said, so, okay, the making of New York, you know, the rise of the vertical city, uh, steel, immigrant labor, the subways are about 15 years off. What about real estate? Oh, you're on Terra Incognito there, I can't help you. And to me, that was a golden ticket. And I spent years going through the records and the deeds, which, thank God, do exist. And uh, there were a lot of women's names, Miss and Mrs. And uh, being a rank amateur, I thought, why is that? Including with Henry Morgenthau Sr. Um, it, <laughs> small digression, I spent 10 years in Russia. And in Russia, that means something different when you sign your property away uh, to your grandmother. Uh, but in this case, it was considered a lady's trade. Um, even in the years uh, after the Civil War, with the exception, of course, of John Jacob Astor um, and the Vanderbilts uh, and the Whitneys, the names we all know. But for Henry uh, uh, Sr., coming up, as we very quickly, elliptically s talked about, you know, uh, through the Brooklyn Public Schools, teaching night school in Lower Manhattan, struggling to lose his German diphthongs. I mean, his papers, and he kept, he was a pack rat. Uh, he kept every single piece of paper, every shard, every ticket, every penny he earned, every penny he spent. And there are reams of this at the, at the Library of Congress and then up at, thank you, Hyde Park at the FDR Library, um, where you can trace how he was constantly trying to strive, as you were saying, to crawl out of the ashes of his father. First, having to intercede. Um, not to give too much away, but he hired the Pinkertons during his wedding day. I'll leave it at that. Uh, and I had the Pinkertons, the Pinkertons report, uh, uh, following Lazarus Morgenthau, and then, as you say, actually interceding physically. It's, um, it's, uh, it's quite a dramatic story, and he's self-made and goes from law, where he was successful, um, into real estate. And then, of course, the subway comes. Yeah, that's, t tell us a little bit about how, oh, I was going to say track his real estate uh, genius, but he follows the building of the subway lines, right? He very quickly moves, and uh, 
uh, my editor said, this sounds like a Horatio Alger story. It's too good to be true. And it was, although it, of course, was not without um, his challenges and certainly not without his risk. He could have been ruined uh, many times. Um, but he has an incredible sense. There are two or three things at work with Senior. Um, he has a, in, an inordinate sense in his own abilities. He also has incredible self-discipline. Uh, and an absolutely insatiable desire to learn and to strive. It was about the accumulation of capital. It was the accumulation of property, but it was much more than that. And, um, and that's the move to politics. But in terms of real estate, he moved from what was once called, I'm not sure if the ladies mile means anything to this audience anymore. Um, but that's where it began, and then 125th Street, and then northern Manhattan, and then uh, the, most of the Bronx, um, at one point or another went through his hands, as well as a few small landmarks like Wall Street, many of the buildings uh, around the Stock Exchange, the plaza, and of course, uh, I spent, uh, oh, I'm embarrassed to admit how many months, if not years, trying to track, which is I think a paragraph in the book, the strange little trapezoidal real estate plot that became Times Square um, is thanks to Henry Morgenthau Sr. Uh, and it's a tale, it could have been in another person's hands, uh, a book into itself. Uh, how he did that and why he chose um, for his good friend Adolf Ox uh, that particular intersection. So there is a, there's a commercial genius there, but he saw himself first and foremost as building a new city which was going to be the capital of our Zion. Our Zion is here in America. And, uh, and I hope we'll talk about Zionism a little bit. So when you talk about um, Adolf Ox, you, the, it reminds us that um, Henry has moved into the Jewish elite in New York, but he also aspires to be in the WASP elite. Just tell us a little bit about how, through the Metropolitan Opera or whatever, he moves into that circle literally into the circle. Literally into the circle. So the Morgenthaus, uh, as I mentioned, came with some money, but not a lot of money. And Lazarus, uh, long story short, uh, was kind of always on the edge of things, looking in. But he, uh, by all accounts, was absolutely charming. And he could charm those who were in uh, what was then known as the Hebrew elite, the German Jews, uh, which later became known as our crowd among themselves. But most of that crowd, so to speak, had come much earlier, before the Civil War. And so the Morgenthaus were catching up. And they never really, in the 19th century, had the money to compete to begin with. So what, June, what Henry Morgenthau, he was never senior in life. <laughs> and uh, uh, what Henry Morgenthau was trying to do, whether consciously or unconsciously, was exactly that, to aspire to a social class and a political class. Once he had the wherewithal to do so, uh, it's an in, uh, incredibly dramatic story how he rebuilt and built the Metropolitan Opera House and other great institutions as well. Uh, the theater that um, would never came to be on Central Park West, uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And there's a, there is a philanthropy that runs to this day in the arts from the Morgenthau family. Uh, it was first and foremost philanthropic. He was also, he and his wife, Josie, were great lovers of the arts. It was a tie to, quote unquote, the old country. Uh, and when he staged, as I reprise, I hope I successfully reprise, the first um, staging of uh, Parsifal Wagner in New York outside of Beirut, it literally led to a court case. And again, it's in the archives. Um, so, but it was, uh, it was an attempt to replicate the social, the social register. Uh, and I think, by and large, by the time of 1910, with the great rabbi Stephen Wise, when they found the free synagogue, and he finds a young man who in, had been, I think, one term. He was longer at Princeton, um, but a one-term governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, not a figure known on the national stage at all. Uh, uh, an absolute dark horse, but Stephen Wise and Morgan thought together, uh, go to him and they say, would you come speak at the Free Synagogue, which was, as many of you know, uh, was the idea of 
uh, a pewless and doless synagogue in response to this building, <laughs> I think it's not even a block away, uh, Temple Emmanuel. And uh, it's an enormously complex story, but it's really the birth of uh, the progressive outreach and what retail, how retail politics was born and identity politics. Uh, and that is the bridge to politics that Henry Sr. made successfully. So he picked the right horse, dark or, or otherwise, and he aspires to be the first Jewish member of the cabinet. He wants to be secretary of the treasury, but he doesn't get it. Tell us a little bit about his uh, experience in you know, a country we've been reading a great deal about today, Turkey. Oh. I was thinking, as I was looking at the, uh, the stories today, I was thinking that's exactly where I, you know, normally we talk about uh, Eastern Anatolia, what was formerly known as Eastern Anatolia, was where the earthquake today Harold was talking about. Um, he very much wanted to be in the, uh, a public servant, and it's the epigraph of the book, uh, I, I had to wait till I was 55, he tells his grandson, the future DA, you don't, it's a privilege. And that really is the idea of reclaiming what privilege meant at that time to, the, to this family. Um, and uh, of course, <laughs> the DA, the future DA, remember those words. So Henry Morgenthau has money, not a great deal of money, uh, but certainly by 1910, he does have the money. It's known as the Jewish seat. Uh, the ambassadorship to Constantinople, as Istanbul was then called. For that reason, and for that reason alone, he didn't want it. And that, begun, that begins a sub-theme, and it actually began earlier with Lazarus, I alluded to, of one, uh, I don't want to be a special pleader for my people, as Woodrow Wilson said, your co-religionists, the Hebrews. He didn't want to be a special pleader, and as Lazarus in Mannheim um, also built bridges, uh, to the Catholics, to the Protestants, to the free thinkers. It was, a, it was that no uh, walls, no bounds, no constrictions should apply to me. And that's very much in the spirit of both Lazarus and Henry Sr. Uh, but Rabbi Wise and others uh, in the community, communities prevailed, and they said, no, Henry, you should do this, and you should do it for us, for the Jews. He accepts it. Uh, he goes to Constantinople. And little did he know, of course, uh, arriving, I think, around Thanksgiving 1913, that he would be there right when the guns of August come. And he's there right uh, at the knife edge of history when World War I breaks out. And here's this, and there's letters, and he, he's a fastidious uh, diary keeper. Uh, diaries are handwritten, and then they're typed, and then they're retyped, and they're, they're uh, voluminous uh, Henry Morgenthau diaries. And then there's their ghost written, and then they're republished. So you're sifting through this for years. Uh, but it's a fascinating evolution of the young immigrant boy who's now literally with the aristocrats, literally with the guys in uniform um, and the women. And he writes about how he's worried. He's often there. He's alone without his wife. And he writes about, you know, I don't speak French. <laughs> and I don't want to speak German, although he did with the German ambassador. He went horseback riding every morning along the Bosphorus. It's a wonderful palazzo um, in the middle of uh, the, the Para quarter where he lived. And he felt himself, as you were alluding to earlier, you know, I've arrived in New York, but now I'm on the world stage. Now I'm with real diplomats. I'm with real uh, aristocrats. And he had an enormous chip on his shoulder, and you can see it in the diaries. Um, the young Turks come to him just after a time, just as when he was the man to see in New York, Teddy Roosevelt came to him. Everyone came to see Henry Morgenthau. It wasn't just Adolf Ox, and it wasn't just Jews, certainly not just Jews. Uh, he was the man to see in New York if he wanted to get something done in either real estate or politics. He also becomes the man to see in Constantinople. Even uh, very early on, he's consulted by the, um, uh, the English ambassador, anyone who comes through, and he oversees this kind of unusual informal um, assembly of uh, a network of informants who become informants. They're the 13 consulates across the former Ottoman Empire, but there's also a huge contingent of clergymen, 
there are nuns, there are missionaries, and there are corporate executives, people that he understands who understand him as well. So he's no longer seen as an American Jew. So he's happy, very happy, except by the young Turks, who constantly, certainly after April 24th, 1915, he's having dinner, sorry to use you as a prop, with one of the young Turks, and the first deportations are happening that very night. When I'm reading the diaries, you think, you know, I'm sure you've had this moment many, many times, in the dim, distant past, it speaks to you, and you think, this can't be. And then you go back, and you go to sleep, you try to sleep, and you wake up, and you look at it again, and you say, it matches up. It's the same night. And they have dinner, they have cigars, they have tea, they have cognac. And then only later, by degree, the reports start coming in. And he goes to those people, having made really allies of them. Later, he's infamously ridiculed by Felix Frankfurter, among others, for trying to negotiate a separate peace with those Turks. But he felt he had this rapport, and he had earned it. Um, it's through that rapport he then says to them, long story short, it's, I don't know, three or four chapters, of gruesome, gruesome detail, uh, which we see again today in Ukraine, he couldn't believe the reports. And of, he, of the genocide. Of the genocide. Of course, he didn't call it genocide at the time. Raphael Lemkin invented the word decades later, but he called it mass murder. He called it the extermination of an entire people. Uh, so he's moved. And he was a very, uh, sort of uh, said this earlier, he was a very careful man self-discipline, but also he didn't want to be seen as stepping out of, we would say today, his lane. He stepped out of his lane. And uh, first uh, Secretary uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan, and then uh, Robert Lansing, who was a lawyer, but a lawyer by the, by the letter of the law, um, said, it's not your business. We're not going to interfere. So this is going to be episodic, because we need to cover at least two more generations. So let's get up to let's get up to the nineties. Let's get up. Let's get to um, Henry Jr., who I was fascinated reading about his development in the considerable shadow of his father, and his journals and his notes, particularly when he rate. I, I guess this is going to stick with me when he rates prospective brides. Was one of his dreams. Now this is the man who became FDR's best friend, arguably, was in this house many, many times. Was he, did he decide to step up? Was that part of his calculation in being so careful about his social place? Well, I think they all married well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and certainly Lazarus did. Um, and uh, it was a calculation of Henry Sr.'s in terms of marriage uh, for the fact that uh, the future DA of, of Manhattan uh, could claim a Lehman as a great-grandfather and the aforementioned Lazarus on uh, the paternal side. Uh, so uh, it was Senior who married into the Lehman family. Um, and Junior, I think, uh, in terms of marriage, married first and foremost for love and for companionship. He married extremely well. He married um, um, Eleanor Fatman. So, uh, and I think... Uh, that uh, was not the consideration. It was more, uh, if, he, if his father had a chip on his shoulder socially, uh, his son had it thanks to the most overbearing father one could imagine. <laughs> and the reason why he went into uh, farming uh, in the, the Fishkill Farms, the family farm in Dutchkill, Dutchess County, was because it was the one thing his father knew nothing about. Uh, although his father, and he did try other things, as you point out in the book, a lot. He of other tried things. other things, and mostly at the at the behest of his father. And he had gone to Turkey when his father was the ambassador three times, uh, and in those very short, almost three years. Um, but he was not a good student. He had uh, failed out of prep school, and he had failed out of Cornell. He was not interested. He probably had almost certainly um, uh, undiagnosed dyslexia. Uh, John Morton Blum said that I would have to read. John Morton Blum uh, spent 15 years working on the Morgenthau Diaries, trying to turn, and he did turn, 872 volumes, which are at the Hyde Park archives, right. 
into three very short, highly readable, brilliant uh, uh, work, The Morgenthau Diaries, Abridged. And so John Warren Blum knew him uh, as well as anyone. And uh, I went to go see him at Yale, and he said uh, two things. One, uh, you're lucky because you, you can do what I didn't, what I couldn't do, because he was essentially working at the behest of the Secretary of Treasury, and he gave me a number of in, uh, immeasurably profitable shortcuts. Um, but he also said the Secretary of Treasury couldn't read. He was nearsighted, he couldn't read, but he also didn't have the stamina to read a book cover to cover. He liked detective fiction, he liked thrillers, uh, but Blum told me that he would have to read his chapters to him aloud. Um, he was an older man then, but still. Uh, but what he did have, which he inherited from his father, was this incredible vision. As a talent spotter, but also the right man at the right time, being so close to FDRs. They met as early as 1914, where, where did they meet? Uh, they met in Dutchess County, but they might have um, actually uh, known each other through letters, certainly, earlier. Senior had met F.D. Roosevelt in 1912 in Baltimore um, at the convention, the Democratic Convention. And those letters, and it's in the diaries, exist. Uh, junior stops and sees him in Washington, but to have done that when he's the assistant secretary of the secretary, uh, of the Navy, excuse me. He, to have met him then, in 1914, he would have already had to have known him. Um, so it's unclear th when the exact first meeting was, but it's 20 years before the White House. And he's at his side, and as you mentioned, he came not only here, he came to Campobello, where uh, Roosevelt vacation, and after 1921, when polio strikes, he was one of the first people to come literally to his side, uh, I think. Louis Howe tried to keep him away, mm -hmm. um, but Mrs. Roosevelt did not. Uh, the key thing about the Roosevelts and the Morgenthaus, uh, just to make it clear, they're the only couple, and it's what John Morton Blum and others, those who knew them I was able to interview uh, as early as possible, said this is the only couple that the Roosevelts, who had their own very complicated, tricky relationship, the most complicated political marriage in the, of the 20th century. This was the only couple that they not only socialized with, they confided in them, they went on vacations, they had New Year's, they had birthdays, they uh, went to on the houseboat to Florida. It's an incredibly complicated and close relationship. And the two Eleanors were close friends. Two Eleanors spelled differently, but that's what FDR was alluding. He calls them my Eleanors, and my, and my two Eleanors. Um, uh, incredibly close. Um, for reasons that uh, uh, we might get into. And the most important relationship, the future Secretary of the Treasury to FDR, he's the sun god. FDR uh, was his best friend, his really his, re his reason for living. Uh, and, uh, and, but the relationship was quadrilateral. It, each one had his or her own relationship with each other in immensely complicated and you write evocatively of the fact that Roosevelt was, accust was accustomed to receiving people, but he went to the Morgenthau farm, right? He was allowed himself to be, it's just a, such a vivid picture, allowed himself to be carried over the portal, which was not accessible, as they would say today, to be in their presence. And it was kind of, in that way, a socially he, evil situation. Absolutely right. No, he, he went to them for one, well, for many good reasons, but it was a refuge. The farm uh, and the, the relationship with the family was a refuge uh, for FDR. Um, he owed him a quite a big deal. <laughs> and that's when we you talk about the research. Among those hundreds of volumes, millions of papers at the FDR library, and then at the Library of Congress, and then elsewhere. Um, I found, I think it's five pages, typewritten, single space. And the Treasury Secretary always had an assistant, uh, long serving, as in decades long serving, Henrietta Klotz, and she not only was a stenographer, but that's why we have the diary. Uh, it's not a diary per se, it's an in and out box. Everything that came across his desk in the 12 years that he was in Washington. But also, the meetings. Henrietta Klotz is always there in the corner. She's in most of the photographs. Taking down verbatim 
everything that everyone is saying, including herself. When she interjects something, she writes it down. It's, it's an amazing uh, um, transcript of history. I, I like those thoughts. I have to say, I was when when Ellie passes away, I was kind of rooting for Mrs. Klotz to leave. <laughs> well, there is that. I think she is, was rooting for there her. There is that too. strain in the family that, that, that did for a time think there might have been something, but absolutely not. No, I mean after. after. They, right. She was right. aspiring to be the second right. Mrs. Walden. Uh, the Soviets thought that they, that they had had a romance, but they were wrong. So Henry gets to be what his father wasn't, right? He gets to be Secretary of the Treasury, which Henry Sr. had aspired to become under Wilson, and he gets the job but he is, as you point out in chap several chapters, he is more than a secretary of the treasury. He is, like his father, involved in things that are sort of beyond his uh, scope of work or his, his uh, official scope of work. Remarkable stuff, including Lend Lease. To tell us a little bit about how he creates this extraordinary portfolio for himself. So he, uh, I, I didn't finish the story, I'll just quickly come back to that because it answers your question right now. That unsigned uh, three or four uh, single page typewritten paper, it, it's unlike anything else in the diaries. And I thought, what is this? And it took me some time. It was, an, it was not a eureka moment. And then I realized this is Henry's list of complaints. Before he's named Secretary of Treasury, and he's fighting to be Secretary of Agriculture, the job that he really wanted. And of course, his friend, Henry Wallace, I say that friend in quotes, uh, more of a rival than a friend, whom he had introduced to FDR. He introduced Hopkins, he introduced Rosamond, he, um, uh, he introduced Henry Wallace, gets the job of agriculture. Um, and as the DA used to say, what do you expect? He's a farmer from Iowa versus a, an upstate Jew uh, from Dutchess County. And that burned him. But in this long list, he says what he would never say to FDR and never say out loud. I did this for you. I did that for you. I did this for you. I did that for you. It's a long litany of everything that he did. But and he it, doesn't submit it. No, it was... It, it, it was you know, it was one of those letters, memo to file, that you write and hope never sees the light of day. Uh, well, it did. And it's what he then carries forth for those 12 years in Washington is uh, not a list of grievances, but certainly IOUs. And from the very beginning, he's handed probably the worst job uh, in the New Deal, farm credit, which was the old Hoover board, which had been a disaster. He does it brilliantly. Uh, working with the farmers across the country. And he travels the country all the time. FDR is saying, who hated flying, you know, is really afraid of flying. Henry, what are you doing getting on that plane? And these were crop dusters. And he loved to fly. So it was a very different image than Henry Morgenthau that, that I had come to know and that most of the books of the history of the New Deal show this kind of glowering, hand-wringing, uh, always self-doubting. He was that. But privately, he was extremely strong. And he knew what he could do, and he wanted to prove it. Not just to his father, but to FDR, and to his wife, uh, Ellie, and first and foremost to himself. So he makes uh, a smashing success of the hardest uh, brief farm credit. He gets the treasury, and he's overwhelmed. It, treasury grows to over 37,000 employees. It was a massive organization, bureaucracies within bureaucracies. Um, but because of that kind of uh, nearsightedness, in the sense of dyslexia. He couldn't do the details, but he was in the perfect place to do, although he was not a New Deal finance guy. He hated uh, the budgets, the bloating budgets that he had to oversee and submit. But he could see the far horizon. And first and foremost, he saw uh, there are chits back and forth at cabinet. Roosevelt said here, and Henry was always on his right in cabinet. Always had lunch with him every Monday. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. His Not only the only Jew in the cabinet, but the only member of the cabinet to have a regular standing lunch, which, of course, didn't win him many friends mm -hmm. uh, on the team of rivals. Um, but in 1933, of course, FDR comes to Washington. Hitler rises in Germany. And Henry writes to FDR at cabinet, do you think there will be war in Europe? And FDR says, yes. And Henry says, and will we have to go in to defend, meaning France and, Germ uh, France and, and England? And FDR says, probably yes. That begins, and they're the only two in the, in the cabinet. This is America first. Uh, they're the only two in the cabinet up until 42 who are really pushing for the rearmament 
uh, first and foremost, of, of England um, and France. Uh, and then, of course, uh, leading the way for war production uh, uh, domestically. It's a massive job and a massive undertaking. And he is constantly self-doubting. But there is the discipline of his father and the urgency that's building. And, and the, the access to FDR. Right? And the access to FDR. He's and empowered by the friendship. He's, empower he's also a little bit uh, afraid of the friendship. And then he leans on Mrs. Roosevelt. And he always has Mrs. Roosevelt, that, that really uh, central but quadrilateral, however you want to see it, four-way relationship between Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, Eleanor Morgenthau, the Secretary of Treasury, and the President of the United States. It works always. He would go to Eleanor Roosevelt and say, how's he doing? How is Franklin? And then he would go in to the bedroom. Uh, and Mrs. Roosevelt, of course, which I hope comes through in the book, says to him, Henry, you are Franklin's conscience. And she didn't mean that lightly. Uh, and so he did, although he doubted himself, he knew that he had that power and the long list of IOUs. So at this time, just to continue our upward trajectory generationally, young Robert is experiencing some of this closeness to power, right? He goes to, I heard him say here, he used to go to, he grilled Frankfurters for the Queen and King of England at, at Hyde Park, and he is um, about to enter World War II. So tell us a little bit about Bob uh, in this period. I'm very thankful. I'm, 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 I was thankful before I sat down, but I'm really thankful, Harold, that you mentioned the hot dog, because, <laughs> because the, uh, uh, the late DA uh, uh, who died 10 days short of his 100th birthday, we did celebrate, he celebrated his 100th early. Uh, he never lived to see this book, and he would be pissed <laughs> that the hot dog story is not in the book. So thank you, Harold. Uh, but you did say that you inadvertently, regrettably, missed the event here. That's right. Uh, yes, he would he also say... And, he did yes. emphasize the hot dog story, so okay, maybe good. you would have... Yes, no, uh, Robert Morgenthau spoke here on immigration, uh, which, uh, which is in the book, um, about 10 years ago. I think it was... A, and so he, I, I heard him when we were driving up tonight saying, it's about time you made it. Uh, Andrew, <laughs> you made it. You're 10 years late, yeah. Um, um, he not only grilled hot dogs uh, from a very early age, uh, you know, we know him as the DA of New York, the Pope of law enforcement, I was told early on. It wasn't just 35 years as DA, it was almost a decade as the chief federal prosecutor in the Southern District, the US Attorney, remade the landscape of law enforcement, not just in this city, but in the country. You look at his earliest letters, his earliest scribbles, and what people wrote about him, the fourth, fifth grade teachers, it's all there. And you know, it's, uh, I don't know how you come down on the Tolstoy theory of history, but there are those, uh, not us, those who are born with just extraordinary gifts. And yes, privilege, but also a humility and a sense of integrity although he was a hooligan uh, as a young boy and had a wicked sense of humor. Very, it got drier as he got older, I think. I, I met him, he was 88, I think, 89. It was already timber dry uh, then, but a wicked sense of humor and a prankster. But he had these gifts, uh, whether they were in athletics, whether they were in leadership, he was the president of this and the president of that. Uh, from and the first Jewish president of this and the first Jewish president of that. Uh, I, I don't know if it would be the first. He certainly didn't th he see didn't it that it. way. Um, and, um, but I think you're right. Uh, the, the historical record, I think you're right. Certainly he was one of the few Jews uh, in his college, Amherst, and one of the few, uh, it, I think the first, to join his fraternity. Um, but it kind of just sort of, he was doing what he did. Um, whether it was graduating Yale Law in two years after surviving 54 months of active duty during World War II. And, and two torpedo attacks, right? Or at least, one kamikaze attack. At least two. At least two. Uh, it, was, it, it bears mentioning because um, uh, it, it's uh, an incredibly important part of the book. 
Um, and you just mentioned um, serving hot dogs. He also served, which is the 45 second film. It's on the website, but we're not gonna show it tonight. The home videos um, that uh, the family found just when I started this of serving um, mint juleps to FDR, Mrs. Roosevelt, Winston Churchill begged off the mint juleps and went straight to the whiskey <laughs> at, at Fishkill Farms. Uh, and Bob Morgenthau was uh, uh, in the Navy then, and he was on a weekend pass. It's the summer of 1942. Um, he had first served in the Med, in the Mediterranean. And at 20, he had actually in, tried to enlist when he was 19, when he was uh, uh, <coughs> still at, in college at Amherst. Uh, he had to, he heard it on the radio that they were starting a new program. He pulled off the West Side Highway and he tried to sign up, but he had to go home to have his mom and dad sign the papers. And he enlisted, of course, before Pearl Harbor. And he enlisted for one reason. He wanted to fight the Germans. And he got his wish. He went to the Mediterranean. His ship um, was sunk. 49 men lost their lives that night. He had to oversee the bur burial of two of them. He had to write the letters home. And within months, he's back at it on a new ship, and he goes to the Pacific. And many of the same men, which was remarkable, I was able to get all the naval documents um, and interviewed as many survivors as I could from all of his ships. I think there were seven ships in all, and seven, seven ships, eight captains, most of whom he didn't appreciate. Um, most of those veterans said, we volunteered to go with him after the sinking of the USS Lansdale. Um, and he went to the Pacific, and that's where there were torpedo waves, wave after wave after kamikazes, uh, both at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Um, so 54 months of active duty, and he's 21, 22, 23 years old, comes home, meets his first child for the first time, born while he's at sea. And uh, it's an incredible story, and that's really the fulcrum of the book, because he finds out that you know, uh, FDR, who happened to be the president, his father's best friend, dies while he's uh, in the Pacific. Um, and he comes home and he, he, we would talk about it, it was the only time in the hundreds and hundreds of hours we spent together where his mind, he would say, are you listening? I said, yeah, uh, because he was telling, have I told you this before? I said, yeah, but I want to hear it again. Um, because each time he added another layer, another texture, and, and often, it was a detail that he had left out. For instance, the night that the, the Lansdale was sunk, I had heard the story several times. And it occurred to me, all the other guys were talking about May West for reasons in this company. Well, you can imagine why they would call a life preserver a May West. And uh, it's a term that people of a certain age would remember. And I said, what happened to your May West? He said, oh, because uh, he was treading water for five, six hours in the Mediterranean, waiting to be rescued. He said, oh, I gave it away. And he just kind of shrugged, like, w as, a, as, as, as if it were an irrelevant detail. Um, each time he told the story of the war, he would turn sideways and look out, first at the DA's office, and probably the slightly larger room than this room, uh, I kid you not, um, office, not as wide, but in length. And he would look out the window, and he would go back and close his eyes, and he would go back to the present tense. It was the only time he talked in the present tense about the war, and he would describe the waters, and he would describe all sorts of things. Um, and uh, I'm absolutely moved that readers have been struck by the role of the messmen, uh, as they were called, the, the black sailors, the only rank that was, not a rank, the only um, role they were allowed in World War II were to cook and serve the officers, and it was the future DA as a young man who put them on the guns, the big guns, and these young sailors stood their guns, and not only that, after getting uh, hammered, came with them, and I was able to track down most of them and their relatives, came with him to the Bower, the Harry Bower that was his ship in the Pacific, and did the exact same thing again, stood on uh, stood their ground while the, on the big guns. So he was, he was proud of that, but he wanted it, he was really speaking to history. 
uh, and especially the Pacific. He wanted to get the Pacific right. <laughs> no one talks about the Pacific. And by the way, as we heard at a program a few weeks ago, there were those like Admiral Nimitz who did not want people of color even to be servers. So that's just a, a, an extra indication of his, uh, of his attitudes. Let me just, let me just it'll take 30 seconds. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. It's not in the book. <laughs> uh, about 800 pages were cut. So I mentioned that I, I found this, the, the relatives, um, James Lode Holt. Uh, the DA didn't remember the name. Uh, he remembered where people were from. He, if he remembered the name, he remembered their middle initial as well. Uh, but this gentleman he didn't remember, and I, I got the ship's manifest, and I tracked it down, and I found his son, uh, who lives nearby, and called him up out of the blue, and I said, I'm very sorry to do this, but, you know, did your father serve in the Pacific? And as much of black American history is lost. And he said, you know, I don't know how to answer you, but I have one thing from my father, and it's a sword, a Japanese sword. Uh, so it obviously was handed down somewhere. Uh, and uh, I was able to, to re reconnect that part of history that his father was one of the mess men. Um. So obviously we're picking and choosing because, I mean, if you had done three volumes, you could have had three sessions like this, but you chose to uh, cut 800 pages but leave us with 1,000. Very, very briefly, because I want to have our audience get the opportunity to ask questions of, of their own. Um, we had uh, a program here on the Ken Burns special, The U.S. and the Holocaust. And of course, the question inevitably is asked. So before it's asked by someone else, I will ask it. Henry fights for as much um, immigration as much refuge as many refugees as possible from FDR. He personally saves tens of thousands of Jews through his own efforts. Could what was the the impasse that he found insurmountable in broadening the policy? And I know what the answer is, but I want you to you to give it. What why was it too little too late? What took him so long? I guess. Yeah. I think it's a fair question, and I think it's a question that, you know, certainly as a biographer, you have to address and interrogate. I, I, I call what I do sort of history, sort of biography, but really investigative nonfiction. And uh, I've talked a little bit about the sources. You, in, you interrogate those sources, and you interrogate them. You don't have a side, and you try to keep an open mind, and you look at the evidence, and you often look for what isn't written. And... The story of the St. Louis, for me, was a sort of a turning point. You all will remember the story of the St. Louis. Uh, Morgenthau is usually seen as the bad guy in that. How dare he, right? The lone Jew in the cabinet. And yet, when you look, which is there verbatim, someone at one point in the production process said, do we really need, not the story of the St. Louis, but do we really need the stenographic record of Morgenthau's intervention? when the ship is being tracked, coming from Cuba to Florida? Yes, we do, because I want readers to see and judge for yourselves. What was he trying to do? Was he doing FDR's bidding? Was he uh, doing the Salzburgers bidding? Uh, was he doing anyone's, you know, whether it be the Jewish communities, whether it be uh, his own turmoil, what is he doing? He's actually trying to keep a tab on them to bring them to a safe harbor, and he doesn't. And that anguish, I talked about the IOUs with his, his best friend, the sun god, Franklin. Uh, he was one of the few in the cabinet to call him Franklin, this man that he had known since uh, you know, 20 years before Washington. And the IOUs are ticking, the toll is ticking, but so is his inner anguish. And the person, so the St. Louis was one, and then the other was his daughter, Dr. Joan Morgenthau. So uh, the Secretary of Treasury and his wife, um, Eleanor Fatman, had three uh, Fatman Morgenthau had three children. Henry III, who used to call the DA my kid brother, he lived to 101, um, and was an extraordinary man, one of, the, one of the founders and pioneers of public 
television, among other things, um, in this country. And uh, their, their sister, Dr. Joan Morgenthau, was an illustrious, eminent pioneer pediatrician, founded, among other things, um, the, uh, the first adolescent uh, youth medical center in East Harlem, out of a trailer. Um, in the 1960s, but she had lived in Washington for most of these years, the war years. So while the boys, as she called them, had either been in Germany, Henry III, or in the Pacific and the Med, Bob, she was there. She saw what was going on with her father and her mother during what the, Checker, the Secretary of Treasury later called those terrible 18 months, when he learns about like his father had learned about the Armenian genocide when he learns about what was going on, the horror, as he called it, in Europe with the Riegner cable in the summer of 1942. And he's fighting what to do, and he has a team of young uh, ideolo ideologues. He was not an ideologue, but they were. A team of young lawyers working for him at the Treasury who are saying, we have to do something to save the Jews. So after the St. Louis, and then when I went to go interview Dr. Jones, she said, you have to understand one thing. My father was completely torn by this, physically. She's a doctor. She said he had migraines. He had suffered migraines most of his life. He had terrible health. But it was a real philosophical and really a, an awakening of faith. He had been you know, kind of born uh, as the assimilist, the assimilist dream child uh, here in Manhattan. And suddenly, during the horror of horrors, when he's having lunch with the president every week, this is building inside him. Uh, not for nothing, some, some call it the most dramatic personal story, the drama uh, of the White House during those war years. Long story short, not to give anything away, January 1944, he goes to FDR. And finally, he says, with the goods, he says, we must do something uh, to save the remaining Jews. It's, there's no question it's too little too late, but that's the beginning of the War Refugee Board. Uh, he didn't see it as his crowning achievement. Mrs. the aforementioned Henrietta Klotz gave him a party. Uh, the young Treasury uh, lawyers, they saw him as kind of championing um, the unchampionable, that they had taken on the State Department, which was deeply entrenched, uh, isolationist, did not, certainly no friend of opening the floodgates for the refugees. And Henry goes to FDR, and FDR famously doesn't read the report, which had been entitled Report to the President on the Murder, uh, on the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jews. That was too much for Henry. He called it Report to the President. Uh, but that, that was the original title, and it's a long and sordid uh, story, much like the response to the Armenians. But the best estimates are, and they're only estimates, um, that as many as 200,000 Jews were saved. By Henry's action? Well, by the War Refugee Award. Yeah. We have only scratched the surface, and um, the, the full story... Well, let me ask you one, one final question, and then we'll turn it over. Get a few questions in from the audience. This is an absurd question because it, you could do it for five minutes, I implore you not to, but what is the Morgenthau legacy as district attorney of Manhattan, which he, the job he held for yeah. decades and uh, basically is inseparable from the conception of the office? It is inseparable um, and it is absolutely resonant today. Um, anyone who reads the papers listens to the radio. Uh, you know, someone was asking me about a case in uh, when he was not DA yet, obviously, in the early 60s when he was the US attorney. Uh, a horrible case, uh, excuse me, of uh, a police shooting. And it doesn't end. Crime is still absolutely on everyone's mind, not just in New York, but across the country. Uh, and when I was writing the book, certainly finishing it, I was trying not to look at the headlines, especially after he had died, um, for many reasons. But one was what the vogue then was progressive prosecution. 
And now we are seeing, without, without keeping it to five minutes, we're seeing the pendulum swing a different direction, uh, away from progressive prosecution, for better or worse. And I'm often asked, what would Bob Morgenthau uh, have thought about uh, his successor, Cyrus Vance, or Cyrus Vance's successor, Alvin Bragg, our current DA um, in New York County? Uh, I'm not going to channel um, uh, uh, Robert Morgenthau's thoughts, except to say what he told me time and again. It's the integrity of the office. It's absolutely it's what it comes down to. You get the best people. And it goes back to the Navy. It goes back to what he learned in the Navy. He was born with these sort of preternatural gifts, a kind of nonchalant belief in himself, an inordinate belief in himself in his own capacities. There was ego, but that wasn't the first, that wasn't the first quality. Incredible gifts, faith in himself. The first line of the book, I won't give it away, is, I mean, I will give it away, I never look back. And he really didn't. He l used me as a mirror to look back. He didn't really have regrets, unlike his father. He did not suffer the hard decisions at all. Um, and the rules were very simple, from the Navy, really. We're going to go through fire together. We're going to get the best people we can. Let them do what they do and get the hell out of the way. And I would add, he didn't, compartmentalization, incredible firewalls. Uh, someone the other day was just telling me a story about uh, Bob Morgan, the DA, calling um, uh, all the time in a certain office uh, in this city. He controlled the levers of the press like no one's business uh, for more than 35 years, as well as politics. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the Bella Abzug scene. Uh, uh, and he made rivals, he made allies, he could build bridges, and he could, uh, these are all quotes, uh, paraphrasing, he held a grudge, he could forgive anyone, um, all of those contradictions, but it's for one thing, really, and it sounds corny, the integrity of the office. And when things burned him, it was about the integrity of the office. You know, he stole, I uh, used to kid him about it, he would say, you know, let the, let the chips, uh, to mix metaphors, uh, let the chips fall where they may, follow the case wherever it goes, and we will pursue the law without fear or favor. That's actually Adolf Hawks, <laughs> his, his slogan from the New York Times. Um, but that's really it. Uh, it does sound corny, but it was the integrity of the office. And when things after, uh, when he finally did resign and leave, I spent the long night when he was uh, packing up uh, the office uh, with his long-serving uh, assistant, Ida Van Lynn, uh, well into the night, almost till midnight on his last night after 35 years. He really thought the office uh, needed to have that absolute ironclad sense of integrity, and that's what he wanted to leave it with. So great answer. Thank you. Andrew. Okay, we have we don't have time, but we'll take a few questions. Uh, right here. Wait for the mic, please, for our Zoom. I always think of uh, Harry Truman as a man of great integrity, as I do the Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau. Why did why did they not see eye to eye, and why did Truman? have a low opinion of him and, and dismiss him? It's a great question, thank you. Um, you know, uh, I came into this as a rank amateur in the Truman versus FDR and the Jews, and, and not that, that you're framing the question that way, but that, that, I soon learned that there is a tremendous divide, we alluded to it before, uh, between FDR, who was better for the Jews? Not that that's what you're saying. And I didn't realize that there's a whole historiography uh, of that. I certainly got a, a baptized in it very quickly. Truman uh, was an unknown, and it's hard for us with the hindsight of history to realize that. He certainly was an unknown to uh, the Secretary of the Treasury. They didn't know each other hardly at all. Truman had barely been to the White House, had barely met physically with FDR. Um, and as uh, I hope I made clear, this was not just a member of the cabinet. 
This was the Secretary of the Treasury, this arguably the most important position. Truman coming in, having his own chips on his uh, block, uh, con has to contend with who is this guy? Nothing, e no easy thing to do, especially after uh, what would have been a fourth term, four term president, FDR. Their initial meetings, which are almost stenographically recorded in those diaries, the Morgenthau diaries, are extraordinary. I had a second set of documents to kind of filter and layer the texture of their meanings, which were a series of letters that the Treasury Secretary dictated to his sons, not to his daughter Joan, who was mostly at home. And he would say, boys last night, including boys last night, I saw the president for the last time. He had been, we skipped over that, he had been in Warm Springs the night, um, the night before FDR suffered his fatal stroke. So there's a series of letters to his sons, which uh, are extraordinary. They're up in Hyde Park as well now. And he talks at length about his relationship with Truman. He couldn't get the measure of the guy. He's always fidgeting. He's always running. He's bouncing up and down like a jelly bean. He just, they just were absolutely antithetical. And of course, he's just, I'm talking about uh, Henry Morgan, though, has just lost his best friend, whom they had a bromance to end all bromances. They could talk about anything, and they did, um, uh, including uh, FDR's uh, very, very close friend, Lucy Mercer, Ruther Rutherford, who was there that last night. And Henry Morgenthau never told the story that she was there that night, uh, the last night that FDR was alive. Truman would later say, what a blockhead. This is what you're referring to, I think. Uh, he said it to, in a letter, unsent, um, uh, from Josephus Daniels uh, Jr. But also he says it in his scrawled diary that was found, I think, in the 1980s in the Truman Library. Um, some very, uh, that, that present as anti-Semitic comments about Henry Morgenthau. But he also says he was a blockhead. He, was, he got himself fired from my cabinet. That's not the way Henry saw it. Henry saw it as there was no way that the two could get along. And he was always going to be, first and foremost, his fealty was to Franklin. He could never be a Truman guy. Uh, and he technically did get himself fired. When Truman goes to Potsdam, Henry finds out in the most awkward ways that he's not going to be on the plane. Um, and then he does the greatest insult. He puts a man in to replace him, a man that he thought very, very little of, um, Henry Morgenthau. So they were never, it was never going to be a love affair. And Truman really wanted to have his own person in there. But it was uh, an absolutely dramatic climax, uh, an, ex an explosive, short-lived relationship. Question. Yes. Hi, my name is Irving Lee. Um, thank you for the book. I have a couple of questions. One of... Just, just do just one. Okay, I'll do, I'll do Henry Sr. I think you alluded to earlier about the fact that when he was ambassador to Turkey that he was given the assignment to uh, draft a peace treaty with Turkey who wanted to withdraw from the war back in 1917 but got browbeaten by Frankfurter and supposedly the British. British didn't want the Turkish to leave the war because they were about to launch an offensive. Could you go over that history, whether or not Henry Sr. felt uncomfortable about that or did he go along with the idea, because eventually he did not, there was no agreement whatsoever. And, uh, and Henry, I guess maybe you alluded earlier about the Zionists, whether that was a factor in the, in the thinking yeah, process. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, and uh, I do go over it a in some detail in the book. It's a complicated story. Um, but no, very quickly, he wasn't given the assignment. He gave himself the assignment. It was a dream uh, that he started nurturing through these alliances that I alluded to with the Turks while he was in Istanbul, Constantinople. And he did always think, first even before the Turks joined with Germany, that we can pull them to our side. He had this incredible belief. He was lecturing a largely Muslim population about the gospel of America uh, and Christianity. 
Uh, this wasn't social gospel stuff. He would literally go and lecture about the gospel, uh, and that was in keeping with our Zion is here in New York, about uh, he really wanted, and, a, and, a, and for a point before the war, the Turks said, would you like to be our finance minister? We need someone like you. And so it's embedded in that sort of idealism that we can do this together. We can make, I mean, I shouldn't laugh. We can make the world better if you're just more like us. That's really what he believed in. It's really what he believed in. And those around him, whether they were their clergymen, missionaries, or the corporate executives, oil and gas in the main, but not only, um, seconded it. Amen. And so that's the, Turk, that's the relationship he had. And so when, obviously, when they do join, <clears throat> excuse me, the Central Powers, when they do join with Germany, he still tries to do this. And he's telling Colonel House, the, uh, Wilson's um, confidant, I can do this. I can, and he was always a lone runner. I can do this on my own. Um, and that's the trip to Gibraltar, that uh, uh, fateful trip to uh, Gibraltar that you're uh, referring to. There's a subtext there that he was also, because this gets way too complicated even to do uh, uh, justice elliptically, um, because, of course, what was Palestine then is under the old Mo Ottoman mandate. He thought, and there come the, the Brits, he thought that he could also do something uh, for Palestine, the Jews of Palestine. That's why Louis Brandeis, I won't, too many characters, uh, Louis, but these are the big names, Louis Brandeis seconds Frankfurter, some job, to keep an eye on Henry Morgenthau on that trip. Frankfurter is there essentially as a spy. And Henry Morgenthau has no idea. So they go uh, to Gibraltar and they meet Chaim uh, Weizmann who says, all bets are off. This is, this is uh, a foolhardy mission. Now, the important for, for the story of the generations, the important theme to take away from that is not hubris, but the idealism behind it, that he actually thought uh, he could do something good. And it was a lone ranger mission. Later, he does the exact same thing in 1933, where he is, goes way rogue in London on the, on the margins of an economic, a world economic conference, and he meets the Soviet foreign minister, which is completely rogue. And he actually there, he lights, which, which I think is unknown history, but it's in the diaries and in letters. He's, we were talking about Campobello. His son was with the President of the United States on Campobello Island, talking about <laughs> monetary policy. And his father is in, is in London saying, you know, I just met with Maxim Litvinov, which was a big no-no. We didn't recognize, as many of you know, we didn't recognize the Soviet Union until 1934, even though in 1917. He meets him, and that really lights the fire for recognition of the Soviet Union. Again, sort of like, which is, a, which is absolutely FDR's thinking. Get me to the top man, let me, let me have him, and we'll work this out. That's the, that's the kind of thinking that, that is behind that. Thank you, though. All I can say is I'm going to take moderator's prerogative here and uh, invite you all upstairs to tread on the ground that Henry Morgenthau once trod. But I will say, you know, we were blessed to have generations of Morgenthaus serving this country, and they were fortunate to have you as their chronicler. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.